And the scripture reading for today is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the 31st to 38th verses. This may sound like a familiar passage from the Gospel of Mark to many of you. It is, it is one of the central passages down a little bit. It is one of the central passages in Mark's Gospel. Remember that last week I said that the uh, 15th verse of the Gospel of Mark was the thesis statement of the entire Gospel. That the kingdom of heaven has come near, repent and believe in the good news. The thesis statement of the entire Gospel of Mark. This passage is a development of that thesis here in the 8th chapter when we take the next step and Mark begins the process of fleshing out just what it means to say that the kingdom of heaven has come, kingdom of God in the Gospel of Mark, the kingdom of God has come near. And so from the eighth chapter. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ It may be difficult for us to hear that passage as gospel. It ends with talk of those who are ashamed of the gospel. It presents the heavy burden of laying down our lives for the sake of the gospel, of taking up our cross and following Jesus. Such calls to discipleship are not the stuff we normally call good news. We call good news the messages about God's love and forgiveness and reconciliation and our wonderful work in the world of sharing that love. All of that is good news. But this business about the cross doesn't always strike us as good news. Well, I hope that today you will see in the words of my sermon that when we learn to live out the gospel in our everyday lives, it is indeed good news. One thing you learn as a pastor is that people come to church for many different reasons. Not only is one person's reason for coming different than another's, but each person, each of us, come for several different reasons. Many come because this is just what you do on Sunday morning. For you see coming to church as part of who you are. Many come because you want to raise your children in the life of a church. Many come because the music lifts your spirit as it so obviously did earlier in this service. Many come because there are a few people here who you enjoy seeing, even if only briefly on a Sunday morning. It's good to touch base and renew those connections. Many come because of some deeply in embedded sense of guilt that arises 
when you don't come. Many come because it just makes you feel better somehow and gives you an extra boost for the week ahead. But there is more to it than any of that. There is, I think, in each of us, something deeper. I believe that in some sense, every single one of you here today is here because you want to be a follower of Jesus. You walked in that door today, or perhaps that one or another, and you knew what was going to happen. You knew that this was, in some way, shape, or form, going to be all about a Jewish guy who lived 2,000 years ago, taught about God in a way that both impressed and provoked people, caused some sort of ruckus that bothered the powerful people of his day, was executed by the religious and political establishment, and whom his followers say was raised from the dead. You knew that that was what you were getting yourself into, and you came anyway. You want to be a follower of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is probably my favorite among the Gospels, and it is my favorite because it is so accepting of common everyday people like you and me who want to be disciples of Jesus. People who come to church for whatever reason, people who may not really know all that much about Jesus, people who have trouble making a grand commitment that really changes the pattern of life, yet people who want to follow Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is for us. At the beginning of the gospel, you see Jesus calls 12 disciples, and they prove themselves to be utterly unaware of what is really going on in Jesus. They want to be followers, but they just don't know what that means, and Jesus never gives up on them. He doesn't kick them out of his inner circle. He doesn't make them pass a test. He doesn't question their motives. They are us, and he accepts them for who they are with their many limitations, and he just keeps on teaching and keeps on showing them what it means to be his follower. And today's passage is when he starts to get rather direct about what it means to be his follower. The central line in this passage if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The rest of the Gospel of Mark from the 8th chapter on is really just an attempt to explain that statement, to explain what it means to take up one's cross and follow Jesus. Now, it is certainly possible and right and necessary to reflect on all the grand and deep theological meanings of that line. I hope you have heard some such reflection in my sermons in the past. But when all is said and done, the most important theology is not that which we say with our words, but that which we say with our lives. Take up your cross and follow me is ultimately about the way we live. So, you're here today. You want to be a follower of Jesus, and followers of Jesus take up their cross, and taking up your cross is about the way you live. So, here are five practical ways to take up your cross and follow Jesus. First, be generous. Yes, generous has many different meanings, but I'm talking here about the one that we probably like to talk about least and that the Bible talks about most. Be generous with your money. What is generous? Now, not to be too cowardly here, but it's complicated. I'm going to give specifics. Don't worry, I'll give you specifics in just a minute. 
But first, a couple things must be said. Generous is when we live with our priorities aligned with God's priorities and then act accordingly. In other words, generous is not first of all about what we give, but rather about the way we live. Generous is about shaping our desires so that using our money to be a blessing to others is just more meaningful to us than using our money for the things that are beyond our own needs. Now let me repeat that. Generous is about shaping our desires so that using our money to be a blessing to others is just more meaningful to us than using our money for things that are beyond our own needs. That is what it means to align our priorities with God's priorities. Okay, and one other preliminary. From those to whom much is given, much will be expected. It's a biblical teaching, and it is certainly true when we talk about generosity. This may go against the spirit of our age, but generosity is a sliding scale. For those with little, generous may be simply taking care of your own basic needs. But for those with more, generous naturally means more. And of course, most of us here today have more. I visited the trusty website, globalrichlist.com, yesterday. Many of you have heard me talk about it before. And I learned yet again that I am the 1%. There are 7 billion people in this world now, and I am the 31,849,353rd richest person in the world. Think about that. 7 billion people, I'm in the 31 millions. The top half of a percent from a global perspective. So, what is generous. Okay, real numbers. It seems to me that based on the Bible and on the realities of our everyday lives, that somewhere between 50 and 50% 50 of your income going to the benefit of others is generous. Now, yes, that's a large range, 5 to 50%, but be honest with yourself. If you're giving less than 5% of your after-tax income to others in some way, shape, or form, then you almost certainly have room for growth. If what you give doesn't pinch at all, then almost surely you have room for growth. If you're up there in the 10, 15, 20% range, thanks be to God, but don't get comfortable. No matter the percentage, remember that it is about aligning our priorities with God's priorities and acting accordingly. So to take up your cross and follow Jesus, be generous. Next, connect the way you spend your time with your life of discipleship, your life of being a follower of Jesus. Many of us spend much of our time working, in our jobs, of course. Many of us uh, spend much of our time raising children. Many spend much of our time volunteering. Many spend much of our time caring for others, or maybe just simply working on your own needs to get through the day. However you spend your time, it is important to be able to see how that is connected to following Jesus. Now, I'm talking here about what the church has called vocation. We all have a vocation, the thing you are called to do. It may not be the same thing throughout life, but the Christian faith has always said that what we do with our time is one of our main ways of being a disciple. 
It might be fairly easy to see if you are a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or even a plumber to see how your time benefits others. But also, if you work in an office, hopefully you can see a way in which the overall business that you're supporting benefits others in some way. If you make that little part that fits on the brakes of a Subaru and keeps people safe as they drive their car, hopefully you'll see how that fits into serving other people. Raising children is a noble calling. Helping others in the community is a noble calling. Sometimes getting dressed every day and making your own lunch, aware that you are still a beloved child of God, even though you can't get out and do anything wonderfully productive in the world, that is a noble calling. If you honestly can't see how what you do with your time is connected to your life of following Jesus, then it may be time to spend your time another way. So to take up your cross and follow Jesus, connect your job, or however you spend your time, with your life of discipleship. Next, assume that violence is not the answer. I won't take the time today to try to convince you that you should join me in believing that Jesus would never have us use violence. I simply make the more modest statement. Your default position should be that violence is not the answer. However you look at life and the world, it is clear that the vast majority of things worth doing, even things that are difficult and confrontational in this world, are doable without violence if we commit ourselves to hard work, a little self-sacrifice, and creativity. Even when faced with those who are obviously willing to use violence against others, nearly everything can be done, nearly everything can be overcome without violence. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. So to take up your cross and follow Jesus, assume that violence is not the answer. Next, spend time with those the Bible variously calls the poor, or widows, orphans, and strangers, or tax collectors and sinners. This was one of the very basic parts of what Jesus was all about. One of the main reasons the powers that be didn't trust him was that he spent time with the vulnerable, the outcast, the powerless. He didn't just heal them. He didn't just lecture them. He spent time with them. He loved them as a friend. That's because the Bible is clear that it is among such people that we are most likely to meet God. We are called to learn about their lives, to understand their sorrows and hopes, to feel how others in our society shame them, to learn what it means to be thought of by so many as worthless. And through our mutual vulnerability through real relationship, to comfort and encourage them. Don't fix them. Don't do something for them. Just spend time with them. Be with those whom others would rather forget. For among them, you are likely to find God. So, take up your cross, to take up your cross and follow Jesus... Spend time with those others would rather leave behind. And finally, fifth thing, admit that sometimes the radicals are right. I think this is a very important part of living as a disciple in the world today. We are so well accustomed to the way things are. We are so comfortable with the idea that the way things are is actually pretty darn good. And the way things are is pretty beneficial to us, and we like to think pretty beneficial to others. But we close our eyes and our hearts to so much in this world. 
Perhaps your list would be somewhat different, almost surely it would be, but here are just a couple of areas in which it seems to me that those radicals, those people who want serious change, may well be right. Our prison system, as a lingering tool of racism, keeping black males from thriving into the full human beings that God intended them to be. Our addiction to oil and the way that every barrel of oil comes with the cost of human lives as we seek to keep enough order in the world to keep the oil flowing. Whatever is in your mind, in that deep place where you don't quite trust yourself, but you think you have an intuition that something just isn't right, in that area, dare to believe that the radicals might just be right. Jesus was a radical. He brought about a revolution. It was not, and it was not meant to be, a quick revolution. For quick revolutions may change societies, but they rarely change cultures. Jesus was a radical who brought a revolution of the way people saw the world. He established love as the lens through which we are to see everything. His revolution ended up changing everything. He was a radical indeed. So to take up your cross and follow Jesus, admit that sometimes the radicals are right. You want to be a disciple of Jesus. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here today. But like the first 12 disciples, we 150 or so disciples need to know what that really means in our lives. What I have said today certainly is not all there is to being a disciple, not all there is to taking up your cross and following Jesus, but we can't, take, we can't talk about taking up our cross and following Jesus unless we talk about these things. Be generous. Be able to connect the way you spend your time with your life of discipleship. Assume that violence is not the answer. Spend time with those the Bible calls the poor. And admit that sometimes the radicals may be right. Live in that way. And God is likely to bless you with the greatest joy in life, the joy of taking up your cross and following Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.